1778 had its highs and lows for the Continental Army under George Washington. The previous year, they had lost the capital, Philadelphia, to the British. The new year brought with it severe cold and found the soldiers huddled in drafty cabins at Valley Forge, wondering where their next meal would come from. A ray of hope emerged in February with France's recognition of the new nation, but that hope faded quickly in the face of poor supply, a lack of clothing, and shortages of everything from food to ammunition. It was a miserable winter, one that even today characterizes the revolution for many Americans. As the weather warmed, however, spirits rose with the temperature. The British abandoned Philadelphia, marching back to New York across New Jersey. The Americans followed, catching up to the Redcoats at Monmouth Courthouse, where they fought them to a standstill. It was a marked improvement over the engagements of the previous year, and training was starting to pay off. The British slipped away that night and settled into defensive positions on Staten Island and Manhattan. So by late 1778, the war in the Middle Atlantic had reached a stalemate. France's entry into the war caused great concern in London, and British troops were diverted to protect the Empire's Caribbean holdings. As the year came to its end, the soldiers left under General Sir Henry Clinton hunkered down to spend a dull winter in New York. To keep the British bottled up, Washington had to again keep his army in the field for the winter. By doing so, he could deny the Royalists access to food and supplies in the countryside. He also had to prepare to counter any unexpected British troop movements to the north or to the south. That meant keeping the army together, something that was not standard practice in the 1700s. Coming on the heels of the previous winter's miserable experience at Valley Forge, the prospect of spending another winter in the field must have been unappealing, but it was a practical necessity. Washington decided to place the core of his army at the small town of Middlebrook, New Jersey, near today's Somerville. Perched at the base of the Wachung Mountains, Washington could protect southern New Jersey while using the mountains to screen his movements to the north, should that become necessary. The infantry started to pour into Middlebrook in early December of 1778. The Continental Artillery, under Brigadier General Henry Knox, was diverted to a safe position to the rear of the American lines at the small crossroads village of Pluckaman. The little town was at the hub of a network of roads raided by British spies as excellent. As seen on this map, surveyed by British Lieutenant John Hill, these roads could handle the weight of heavy cannon and the punishment of ammunition and baggage wagons. Even today, the village is at the junction of Interstates 287 and 78 and State Routes 202 and 206. In part because of this advantage, Washington also decided to locate the field arm of the Military Stores Department at Pluckerman for the winter. In fact, the winter cantonment at Pluckerman was much more ambitious than most people recognized then or now. Joining 22 companies of artillery were two companies of craftsmen. They were artificers or skilled craftsmen such as carpenters, joiners, blacksmiths and wheelwrights, as well as a company of continental armorers who were gunsmiths and weapon specialists. This allowed Knox to build a much more substantial set of buildings than the simple log cabins that made up other winter camps. This drawing is one of only three contemporary drawings of American Revolutionary War winter cantonments known to exist. It was drawn by John Lilly, a captain in the 3rd Continental Artillery, who was later at West Point when that military academy was founded. What his drawing shows is truly remarkable, and a combination of historical research and archaeology has revealed the nature and function of the various buildings. At the center of the camp is an academy, erected by Knox for training his officers. Described in the records as 30 by 50 feet, with a plastered interior and glass windows, this was the nation's first military academy. Adjacent to it was a so-called long room, used as a headquarters office. On the other side of the academy was the new line of barracks, built to house seven companies of Lamb's Regiment of Artillery. It was called new because the first barracks was a much longer building designed to accommodate 15 companies of artillerists who had begun to arrive on December 7th of 1778. The officers initially stayed in houses in town and around the countryside, but eventually they moved into barracks constructed specifically for their use. The two lieutenant colonels who were present throughout the winter were placed in roomier quarters uphill, in keeping with the pyramidal hierarchy of the army. Downhill was a guardhouse to keep everyone in place. The unfinished building to the right, along the southern edge of the camp, was probably a set of warehouses for gun carriages, wagons, and materials of the military stores department. In the right-hand side of the long building to the southeast, there were workshops, such as a forge and gunsmith shop, and the armorers and artificers were quartered in the left-hand side of that building. 
The scatter of cabins to the far left, at the northern end of the site, was probably used by camp followers, settlers, who were merchants selling items to soldiers, as well as for a variety of other purposes. The building of the Pluckerman Cantonment was a remarkable accomplishment, achieved over the span of just a few weeks. Artillerists trained there, officers studied in the academy, craftsmen made and repaired equipment, and the military stores department gathered materiel and resupplied the larger American army for the coming campaign. But remarkably, in the spring and summer of 1779, the site was gradually abandoned. It continued as a general hospital during the next winter, but for various reasons, Washington decided to move his primary camp farther north, to Morristown. Then the site, once a beehive of military activity, reverted back to field and forest, eventually forgotten by all but a handful of locals. In the 1980s, spurred by the threat of logging and residential development on the site, a team of archaeologists from the nonprofit Pluckerman Archaeological Project spent a decade uncovering the remains of the cantonment. After clearing the brush and laying out a carefully placed grid system, their surveys mapped piles of stone where John Lilly had once shown chimneys, and lines of rock marked old walls. Careful plotting of these features and of the artifacts scattered across the surface clearly showed the archaeologists what had taken place in various parts of the camp. In the area of the officers' quarters, for example, Chinese porcelain tea service, along with better cuts of meat and fancier accoutrements, revealed a much more privileged and well-supplied lifestyle. It's a stark contrast to the privations of the previous winter. The forge area and the armorer's shop provided glimpses of the weaponry of the period and successful efforts at repair, manufacture, and resupply. The digging also uncovered the walls of their barracks, a fireplace and a hearth with charred wood and ashes still in place, and nails and pane glass that reveal a much more sophisticated construction than the log cabins of Valley Forge. Although the excavations at Pluckerman concluded in 1989, work on the collection of over a million artifacts continues. Under the auspices of the Friends of the Jacobus Vanderbeer House, a consortium of researchers from Washington College, Monmouth University, and Hunter Research are analyzing materials, compiling databases, and shedding new light on one of the country's most important archaeological sites. As the work progresses, it's now possible to think about reconstructing the artillery cantonment, if not in wood and stone, then at least in the computer. The Washington College GIS Laboratory is combining historical and archaeological information to create a three-dimensional model showing what the site might have looked like in 1779. General Knox set up his quarters in a civilian residence north of the cantonment. The Jacobus Vanderveer House was located on the main road from Pluckerman up to Bernardsville and Morristown. Senior officers often took up quarters in civilian residences. Knox's family, including his wife Lucy and a daughter who died in infancy that winter, moved south to join him for the winter. When Knox rode south to join his troops in their camp, he had to pass over the Raritan River and buy a saw and grist mill. This mill may also have factored into his decision to camp at Pluckerman. This part of New Jersey was full of mills and forges, which made the region an important element of the American supply effort. Approaching the crossroads village of Pluckerman, Knox could see the looming second Wachung Mountain to the left. At the base of the hill lay the quarters of his artillery. Drawn up like an E stood on end were the five main buildings of the cantonment, and parade grounds lay between the buildings. On the trail leading into the cantonment, General Knox had a guardhouse constructed to control access to the grounds. As visitors approached the cantonment, they would immediately notice the main academy building, the nation's first military academy, rising above the other structures with a long line of barracks to the left of the academy. Archaeological remains suggest that upon entering a doorway, a visitor was faced with a chimney and rooms opening up on either side of that chimney. Each pair of rooms would have housed one company with 15 to 20 men in each room. Bunks must have been stacked one above another, as was found in other barracks of this period. The fireplaces were uncovered by archaeologists, and pairs of rooms shared a common chimney. Lily's drawings showed no windows on the front facade, but on April 6th, as the weather turned warmer, company commanders were ordered to have windows cut into the rear of the rooms. The north line of barracks offers some insights into the difficulties Knox's craftsmen and soldiers faced. Trees had to be cleared and stones collected for use in chimneys, and then the ground had to be leveled. 
With a 450-foot-long building running down a steep slope, it must have been necessary to dig a series of level platforms into the hillside and step each room of the building down. Running at a right angle along the base of the hill were quarters for officers, with regimental officers in a cabin uphill. Unlike the log soldiers' barracks, these buildings were probably clad in siding and had glass windows. The officers' quarters were much finer than the soldiers, with individual beds, single fireplaces, and tables with chairs. There were reports of the officers entertaining ladies from the village of Pluckaman as well. Archaeologists found oyster shells, beef and pork bones, and Chinese porcelain in trash piles behind these barracks, giving clear indications of what life was like. The two lieutenant colonels had their own quarters higher up on the hill, allowing them to overlook the entire cantonment in keeping with the pyramidal hierarchy of the army. Uphill and adjacent to the academy was the new line of barracks, built to house seven companies of Lamb's Regiment of Artillery. It was called New because the first barracks was a much longer building designed to house the first units to arrive on site. To the right of the officers' barracks were quarters for artificers, followed by a tinsmith shop, a gunsmith shop, and the forge. Wagons were rebuilt there, horses shod, weapons repaired, and bullets cast. In the gunsmith or armorer's shop, flintlocks were repaired, as well as bayonets and other weapons. At least four forges were constructed for general blacksmithing. These were critical to repairing equipment from both the artillery and the infantry quartered to the south at Middlebrook. Workbenches for finishing, filing, and assembling were placed in the front of the building under windows that provided much needed light. Charcoal fires were used to heat iron, and bellows helped to achieve the temperatures needed to make iron malleable. The forges were in the back of the building, away from the light, so that the smiths could judge heat by the glowing colors of the iron. Along the southern edge of the camp was a long building shown in John Lilly's drawing. This was probably simple warehouses and storage sheds for the supplies of the artillery and the military storage department. Taking center stage, however, was the academy, a 30 by 50 foot building where officers were instructed in military science, flanked by the new line of barracks running uphill and headquarters rooms on the downhill side called the long room. The academy was the most detailed and finely constructed building at the cantonment. It was plastered inside with wooden floors, glazed windows, and topped by a cupola. Inside, courses were taught by Christopher Collis, an Irish-American engineer, mathematician, and inventor. When not in use for classes, the space was sometimes used for dances and entertainment, leading Nathaniel Green to call it the Palace at Pluckerman. The artillery at Pluckerman was the reserve artillery for the Continental Army, as well as the guns for the 22 companies present at the cantonment. It was made up of a variety of pieces, from three pounders to 24 pounders, along with five and a half and eight inch brass howitzers. During the winter, the troops practiced loading, firing, and maneuvering, while also learning a new system of signals to coordinate their efforts. Artillery was an essential component of the Continental Army, and the progress made at Pluckerman helped ensure their long-term success. What Knox and his men built at Pluckerman was remarkable. It mirrored what he had recommended to Congress as early as 1776 in his hints for the improvement of artillery of the United States. He advocated establishing military supplies and manufacturing depots around the country, 
along with military academies where officers could learn their craft. During the winter of 1778-1779, the training and resupply of the Continental Army that took place at Pluckerman helped to fashion an army that could stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with the most powerful force in the world and that would eventually defeat the British at Yorktown. <laughs>